I think there are two sorts of religious scientist. One is the creationist, someone who believes that everything was created and what we're seeing is just what the creator left around. And I regard that simply as uh, intellectual excrement of the first order, and I don't think we need to worry about it any further. The, the second sort, the one that we do have to take seriously, are the believing scientists, the, the people who are really making an intellectual effort to coordinate their system of beliefs with the tide of scientific discoveries, which are slowly pushing them further and further back into metaphor. I think the acid test of the... Uh, of, of the battle that is going on between science and religion would be science's ability to show that the entire world could tumble out of nothing. It's already got back to within a photon's throw of the or or origin of the universe as we've gone back into the Big Bang and almost to the point of talking about what happened before the Big Bang. And I see no reason why we should not um, be able to go beyond the Big Bang and talk about its inception, how the universe emerged from absolutely nothing, not just empty space, but from nothing, and how it did so without intervention. Now, if science can do that, then I think that the religious must concede defeat. Well, my answer to that would be twofold. First of all, I don't think that God is in the world as uh, another object among objects, uh, another cause among causes. So that, of course, as explanations for objects and causes are found scientifically, the need for that extra object, that extra hypothesis in Laplace's phrase, disappears from view. God's role is of undergirding the world, of keeping the whole show in existence, being its guarantor. So his relationship is different in that respect, and he can't be squeezed out because he's not caught within the process. The other thing I would want to say is that I don't think that science will encounter barriers within its own defined enterprise. I think the questions that it permits itself to ask, it will, with luck, be able to answer. But it seems to me that science imposes barriers on itself by its method, by its concern with uh, phenomena that can be manipulated and with certain types of question which denies it the opportunity to come into grips with other questions, in particular questions of meaning and purpose. Most of the time, science and religion deal with different categories of our experience, and there is therefore no conflict between them. But when science probes into the very creation of the universe, it is surely disturbing religious ground. The key question is whether science can push its understanding back into the earliest moments of the creation and discover why the Big Bang itself happened. Some of the latest discoveries are encouraging belief in a complete scientific explanation of the creation. So does Paul Davis feel that the conventional picture of God is under threat? Well, it's certainly true that the traditional God has had to retreat further and further in the face of scientific advance. We now have a picture of a universe which runs itself perfectly satisfactorily without the need for any supernatural agency. We don't need a god anymore to, as it were, oil the cogwheels of the cosmic machine. I think there's a particular difficulty about the idea of uh, a god who answers prayers, a god who sits in judgment, a god who involves himself in the day-to-day -day affairs of the world. And the problem is that in the modern scientific version of the creation, we see that space and time are themselves part of this creation. So any god has to be a god outside of time. And it's very hard to reconcile such a god with the notion of a, a personal god, one who answers prayers and so forth. Now, many people would like to believe that God caused the Big Bang, uh, lit the blue touch paper and then retired. In the old version of the creation, something like this was actually necessary because, in fact, all of the important structures that we observe, from atoms up to galaxies, could not really be explained on the basis of the old Big Bang theory. They had to be put in by hand at the beginning, uh, as it were, God-given. Now, in the more recent version of the Big Bang, things have changed completely. We now have a totally new way of looking at the universe. There are some very recent developments in high-energy physics which have completely changed our whole outlook and which open up the prospect that we may be able to explain where all of these important structures have come from entirely within the laws of physics, without the need for any sort of special initial conditions. 
So when we're considering the creation, we may no longer need to wonder about God, but we can certainly wonder about physics. Alan Goof is professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His ideas are revolutionizing science's picture of the creation. Goof has developed a new mathematical description of the Big Bang, which helps to explain how the universe could have appeared out of nothing. These ideas are jokingly known as the free lunch hypothesis. The official title is the inflationary theory. Uh, what it is is a new description for the first minute fraction of a second of the history of the universe. Now this minute fraction is so small that there's not really a word for it in our language. But if you can imagine how much time it takes for light to cross a single proton, the time period that I'm talking about is actually about a billion times smaller than that. Uh, the key feature of the inflationary model is that during its early history, the universe goes through a very brief period of extraordinary expansion. Uh, now, this can be confusing because in standard cosmology, the universe is also expanding very rapidly. Uh, but in the inflationary model, the rate of expansion is really enormously larger. According to the inflationary theory, the Big Bang was considerably more violent than scientists had previously supposed. Under such extreme conditions, the laws of physics have strange consequences. And Alan Goof's ideas can actually explain where everything in the universe came from. Uh, one other amazing consequence of the inflationary model is the actual production of matter. Uh, during the period of rapid expansion, it's possible for the universe to siphon energy from the gravitational field and use this energy to produce all of the matter that we see in the universe today. Uh, it's necessary to start with about a few kilograms. Uh, and then everything else can be produced for free. Uh, so while people often say that there's no such thing as a free lunch, the inflationary model predicts that the universe itself may be the ultimate free lunch. So in the free lunch account of creation, only a small initial seed of matter was necessary to set the Big Bang off. Everything else appeared as if for free through a loophole in the laws of physics. But might science be able to explain where even that initial seed came from? Well, now, of course, we're in a very speculative realm, but I would say that there certainly is a possibility. Uh, the situation in physics right now is that we still have not been able to combine what we understand about gravity with what we understand about the quantum theory, which we use to describe the behavior of atoms. Uh, now, we certainly believe that at some point we will be able to synthesize these ideas, and they have very important characteristics. Uh, the characteristic of our theory of gravity, due to Einstein, is that gravity is a description of the geometry of space. Uh, in the meantime, an important characteristic of quantum theory is that any physical system can undergo random changes in its state. An electron can randomly move from one state in an atom to another state. Uh, now, what this suggests is the possibility uh, that the geometry of the universe can change from a state of absolute nothingness uh, to a state of a very small universe, which can then expand by the process of inflation to produce the universe that we see. Now, all this is very speculative. We don't have a theory to back this up. Uh, but it does appear that the possibility for this kind of a phenomenon exists. So you believe it makes sense for science to investigate the possibility of an explanation for what really is the creation of the universe from nothing? It's an amazing feature that seems to be emerging from our study of physics that it does appear possible that if we knew what the fundamental laws of nature were, uh, that it may not be necessary to, in addition to that, make suppositions about the initial state of matter. It seems possible that the fundamental laws of nature can start with absolutely nothing and produce the universe that we see. It is enormously hard to picture Alan Guth's new vision of the beginning. In a timeless and dimensionless void, the simple laws of physics allowed random fluctuations to create an explosive seed that blossomed into the universe we know. delighted with the information that we're getting from people who are studying the earliest stages of the universe. The very latest theories seem to be showing us that there is simplicity at the heart of all the complexity we see around us. Complexity such as in the, the growth of a plant or the behavior of a person. That at root there is just simple, a simple network of processes all linked together. Too often, people, when they're presented with scientific theories, are overcome by the complexity of it all and fail to see the trees for the wood, in effect, that there is just a very simple collection of, of processes going on, but they're all linked together in a very complicated way. 